Good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up today on our last day of class. Uh, before we get started on the material for today, I just uh, I want to point out that I know uh, a lot of you have sent me emails, and I know a lot of people are having trouble with uh, the lab simulation and getting it to run. Most of the people that emailed me, I believe I emailed everyone back with an uh, alternative simulation that runs in a web browser. Uh, if I did not, if I missed your email or I forgot to respond to it, I get about 10,000 emails a day these days. Uh, so it wasn't intentional, but please uh, let me know. I'm being very lenient with the deadline here on this lab, just given the trouble uh, people are having. So don't worry if you're uh, late with the lab or if you guys, uh, if you can work uh, together with someone who has it running, uh, that's, that would be perfectly fine too. Uh, so if you're uh, listening to the recording later on, please email me if you're still having trouble. For those of you that are attending live, is anyone here having trouble with the lab still? Okay, uh, that's good. It's, uh, again, initially that, we were going to do that simulation regardless of whether we were on campus or not. So uh, the computers in the lab are all set up to run it. So that's, most of those simulations run in a web browser. That is one of the few that does not. Uh, so unfortunately, sorry for the trouble. Anyway, uh, regarding our last uh, day of material here, uh, a lot of this course, uh, with the exception of right in the beginning, I try to keep the course focused on physics for the sake for the sake of the other sciences. So why, why is physics really cool? Uh, if you're a biologist or if you're a chemist, what physics should you know uh, if you're going into these fields? And through that, <clears throat> my goal is to kind of teach you physics in the context of something that you know, context of the main thing you're studying since most people are in this course are bio and chem majors. Uh, that being said, throughout, uh, over the course of the past year, I hope I've given you some reason to at least think that there's some cool stuff in physics for the sake of physics. Uh, and today, today is one of the lectures that I really like to focus on. Uh, it's almost certainly something you've heard a little bit about just culturally the theory of relativity. Uh, and you might know that it has something to do with you know, time and space and uh, somehow the, the equation E equals MC squared is involved in there, but what does that mean? Uh, so for today's final lecture, I want to give you a brief introduction to the basics of the theory of relativity. It's a lot of really cool stuff, but it's definitely physics for the sake of physics. But in some ways, uh, it's the reason people who do physics for a living really do physics. It's really cool stuff. We're not, as much as I really love blocks uh, sliding down ramps and things, the theory of relativity is much, much cooler. And really, it's the reason people major in physics and have careers in physics, or one of those reasons. There's cool, there's a, uh, it's not mundane, it's not what you would expect, and it's very counterintuitive. So I'm going to give you a brief uh, intro to that today. We're, of course, only going to hit the basics, but if you went on and would do a third semester of physics, this is where you would start. So uh, giving you an idea of what would come next. Though I don't blame you guys for not, uh, I'm not holding against you if you don't take a third semester of physics, so don't worry about that. So, going back a few weeks, uh, when we finished our discussion of electricity and magnetism, the last thing I briefly mentioned was that uh, in Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, he predicted and Heinrich Hertz then experimentally showed that electric and magnetic fields can support waves. 
mostly due to due Faraday's law and Ampere's law, the fact that a changing magnetic field can produce a changing electric field and vice versa. This effect produ uh, produces waves that travel at a speed given by two of the constants from electromagnetic theory combined in this formula. And that speed is, of course, what we know as the speed of light. And it's, uh, the theory predicts that it's a constant, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And didn't go into much of that. We didn't really think about what it means to have a speed that's a constant, but it leads into a very big ambiguity, something that you might not think about, but is actually, uh, you can understand just with a few analogies. And really the main question is, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, but relative to what? What's the uh, reference point for that measurement? And as we think about this, the problem, if we go back to first semester physics and we think about velocity, uh, everything has to be measured relative to a coordinate system. Are we, is this speed of light three times 10 to the eighth meters per second? Is it being measured by someone standing on the ground, looking at a flashlight, uh, theoretically watching the beam of light go by? Or is it measured, is it three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, measured by someone in a car traveling 60 miles per hour in the direction the light's moving? Really, those two people should measure different speeds. It's kind of like if you're on a highway, right, and you're, uh, you're driving 60 miles per hour down the highway, and a car passes you at 65 miles per hour. If you, in your car, look at that other car and you pretend you couldn't see the rest of the ground or something, that car seems to pass you at five miles per hour. If you're moving, you only, and an object is moving by you, or you're passing an object, really the only thing you can measure is the difference in your speeds. That's called the relative speed. Speed and velocity is a relative measurement in this way. It depends on where you are and how fast you're moving. So if I'm standing on the side of the highway, I see you moving at 60 miles per hour, I see the other guy moving at 65. But you in your car, if you're moving at a constant speed, more or less feels like you're sitting still and that other guy is passing you at five miles per hour. Assuming, of course, you can't, obviously, you have to pretend you can't see the rest of the world around you and you can only see that car. Makes more sense maybe if you're in rocket ships in space and you can't really, if you couldn't see anything around you and everything around you was dark, even if you're in a moving car, you would feel like you were at rest. So this leads into this ambiguity. The speed of light is 300 million meters per second, but who's measuring that? Or in the more scientific sense, we could say 300 million meters per second relative to what? What's our reference point to that number? Is it someone standing on the sun? Is it someone standing on the ground on the earth? In this car traveling 60 miles per hour? Uh, this is a big ambiguity and it's not, the theory doesn't answer it for us. So just kind of like illustrating this here. Uh, so this idea of relative velocities, originally the, the idea of relative velocities was developed by Galileo hundreds of years ago. So it's not something that's new in physics. Uh, but we have these different people that are moving at different speeds. And we could think of this light beam that's passing by here. That's this like red little wave thing that's over here. So here's a light beam and it's moving past all these people. And theoretically, they're all going about their day, riding their bike running down the street, uh, everyone six feet apart, social distancing. And at the same time as they're going about their day, of course they want to be doing physics experiments because why wouldn't you? So here you have this light beam and really if light worked like any other object, Amy would measure the light beam moving at 300, meter, 300 million meters per second, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. If she's the one that sees three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, our runner here, who for some reason we don't give a name, 
because we just don't like them as much as the other people in the problem. I don't know why. Uh, the runner would see the light moving at 300 million meters per second minus five meters per second. So you have to subtract his own speed. That would be the same for Bill on his bike. Carlos would have to subtract 15 meters per second. However, the, the issue is here is that Maxwell's theory doesn't say lights, light moves at three times 10 to the eight meters per second relative to Amy. It just says it moves at three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So the question is, in what, it, we would say in physics, in which of these different reference frames or points of view is the speed of light three times 10 to the eight? We don't know. And this is a big, this was a big unanswered question at the beginning of the 20th century. And answering it uh, was really one of the first things that opened, uh, that kind of started the modern era of physics. So the first proposed theory was that, well, we didn't really know what electric and magnetic fields were. Uh, so there are these kind of abstract things that caused forces to exist in space. But the proposal was, well, maybe electric and magnetic fields were kind of disturbances in this very light thing, this thing that exists in space that we called the ether, spelled like so. And this was proposed as being something that filled all of space. It didn't really cause any resistance or friction, so the uh, things can move through it without slowing down or losing energy. Uh, but what it did is that the ether was the thing in which electric and magnetic fields existed. So electric and magnetic fields were disturbances in the ether, kind of like water waves were disturbances in the water molecules on the surface of a pond. So it's a very kind of mechanical picture of what electric and magnetic fields are. And so this uh, was proposed because it would be an answer to this question that, well, light would move at three times 10 to the eighth meters per second relative to the ether. Something moving through the ether, for instance, if we're on the earth here that moves through the ether, as you can see down here in the lower left, you can watch it go by. We, aren't we having fun just moving through the ether like that? So if we're in the ether moving, we would have to add or subtract our speed through the ether to get the speed of light that we would measure. We know now that this is not a correct model. Uh, the ether, there's no evidence for it existing, that electric and magnetic fields are not a mechanical dis a disturbance in a mechanical physical medium like this. Uh, but this was the proposal at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so, one of the ways to kind of prove this, because of course, if you make a proposal or a model in science, you have to prove it experimentally, was to try to measure the different, the speed of light uh, in this uh, medium and compare it and see if it changes as you change how you're moving. The people who proposed to do this were these two scientists, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley. They uh, proposed an optics experiment uh, that would, use the Earth's velocity re with respect to the ether and hence try to prove that it existed. Uh, historical fact is that Michelson is a uh, graduate of the US Naval Academy and he won the, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for this experiment. Uh, they actually did not see any proof of the ether. So it was, a, it was a null result experiment and one of the most famous null results in the history of science. But uh, he was a local guy from Maryland, graduate of the Naval Academy. He was living in Ohio when he did the experiment. Uh, but the Naval Academy, their, uh, one of their science buildings is named Michelson Hall after, in honor of him. Uh, and he was the first American to win the Nobel Prize in physics. So let's see what, what their experiment involved here. So, Basically, what they wanted to do is they wanted to measure light moving. They wanted to basically get two beams of light. And they, I don't know why the Earth stopped moving here, but oh well, probably because I'm drawing. So they wanted to take one beam of light and shine it along the direction the Earth was moving and try to measure its speed. 
and then take a second beam of light and shine it perpendicular to the way the direction, the direction the Earth is moving and effectively measure its speed and hopefully see a difference. Now this is, in theory, this is easy to explain, but experimentally it's exceptionally hard to do because how one, how do you measure the speed of light? And two, how do you get the beams of light going in these directions? Uh, it's exceptionally hard. Uh, but uh, it can be done. But basically, that's the, the idea of their experiment is just to do that. This beam, if the ether exists, this beam should move at a speed, uh, speed of light minus the speed of the Earth. So C minus whatever the speed of the Earth is, which is about 20,000, 30,000 meters per second around the, around the sun. Uh, this beam of light, would not, you would not have to add or subtract the Earth's speed. So they should be seen as moving at different speeds if the ether postulate or hypothesis is true. So how did they do this? Well, so what they did was set up uh, a system with effectively three mirrors. One of them is here. One of them is here. And then there's a third mirror that is partially reflecting. And we call that a beam splitter. So they sent in a beam of light hitting this beam splitter and they split it in two. One of the beams is reflected to mirror one. The other beam is transmitted down to mirror two. And then they travel back and then eventually overlap over here uh, on the fourth arm of this experiment. Now, one of these beams, one of these mirrors is aligned parallel to the direction the Earth is moving in space. And one of them, then the other one is by definition perpendicular. So what they should see is if, uh, if the speed of light is different on these two different directions, then the ether does, the ether hypothesis is, that's evidence for the ether hypothesis. And so, what they would see if this hypothesis was true, well, they would see they'd send the beam of light in, it would split into two, but one would be slowed down more than the other, even if the, the arm lengths are the same. So even if the distance from the mirror, both mirrors to the beam splitter is the same, one of those beams would travel more slowly and be slowed down a bit and you would get some constructive and destructive interference. And it would produce a fringe pattern very similar to the ones we saw in lab earlier in the semester. So you'd see these lines of bright and dark fringes. And if they changed the, if they changed the orientation of these mirrors, for instance, if they had them on a table that could rotate and they rotated these mirrors so that uh, they were no longer parallel and perpendicular to the Earth's motion, they would see these fringes move and change. That's the main idea of the experiment. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what their experiment looked like, they had it, this is a, a photograph in the center here. This is the beam splitter. And this is a kind of a simplified diagram here. They actually uh, had the beam reflect off multiple mirrors to make the path longer. It reduced the error in the experiment. So these like ends of the, the two mirror ends of the arms are here. Uh, this is a light source. And over here, if you could kind of see it, there's a telescope that they're looking at to hopefully see the fringe pattern. And then this whole big granite, it's a big uh, concrete or granite table that is, uh, the reason that exists is so that they can uh, limit vibrations so they don't see the fringes move due to just vibrations from outside or from people walking around on the floor above, et cetera. And in order to change how the mirrors are oriented and to get them oriented parallel to the Earth's direction of motion and perpendicular, uh, they, the whole table has to sit on this rotation stage. So it's an exceptionally complicated experiment. Uh, and of course, uh, they ended up seeing nothing. They, see, they saw no change in the fringe pattern uh, when they tried to rotate the mirrors. 
so they could get no evidence of the ether, of the ether at all. It was a com uh, completely null result. And lots of physicists at the time did not want to accept this. Uh, the ether was a very popular hypothesis. It caused a lot of controversy, so they had to do this experiment again. They said, well, maybe, maybe at that point in the year, the Earth was moving through a part in space where the ether was moving at the same speed, so we wouldn't see any effects. So you really have to do this experiment at a different time of the year when the Earth's in a different part of its orbit. So they did that, and they still saw nothing. And eventually, it had to be accepted that uh, the ether didn't exist. So when the table here is rotated, and they tried this experiment again and again, nothing, they see nothing. Uh, so the speed of light, the ether, if the ether doesn't exist, the speed of light is not measured relative to the ether. So we're back to uh, the same problem we had before. And the hypothesis to uh, explain it was uh, originally put together by Einstein. And he's a theoretical physicist, didn't really do experiments for a living. Uh, and he made this proposal without really knowledge of Michelson Morley's experiments, just and their results. He just kind of. So his proposal was that basically we should just go and, and work with what the math tells us. And and just see what see where that leads. So if the theory says, if the theory doesn't say who's measuring the speed of light, what we have to say is that, well, basically everyone, no matter how fast they're moving, no matter the direction they're moving, that everyone will see light move at this speed, 300 million meters per second. And that this was this speed was special. It's a special constant of nature. It doesn't follow these relative velocity rules like the velocity of a car or a bike. Uh, and that this means it's valid for everyone, regardless of whether you're measuring the speed of a light beam from your bike, from your car, from standing still on the road. Everyone will measure the same speed. It makes no intuitive sense, but Einstein's proposal is that even if it makes no intuitive sense, we should try to follow the mathematics. So uh, this is his proposal that, uh, however, it leads to some really, really uh, unintuitive results and ideas about how space and time and physics work. So I'm going to try to explain a few of those to you uh, in today's class. So here, we're going to consider an experiment that is, a, and consider what this speed of light being a constant for everyone really means. So we're going to build a, a hypothetical experiment here. Uh, here uh, we have, what we have are two gigantic mirrors in space. And we have a laser pointer at the bottom of one mirror at this point one here. And we shine that laser pointer up, the laser pointer hits mirror two, hits mirror at point two, reflects back down, eventually getting to the, uh, back to the first mirror point three. So we're measuring this, we're sitting at rest on the north pole of Earth. So here we are, standing there doing this experiment. The mirrors are some distance d apart that we can measure easily. And light travels for everyone, so for us now, at a speed of c, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we're going to measure a time for this travel from the first mirror to the second mirror called t naught. So the math of this experiment is pretty easy. Here we are on the ground at the North Pole. We know the speed of light, so basically, if we knew that distance, the speed of light has to be equal to distance divided by time. It's a constant speed. So it moves a distance d in a time t0. 
So if we knew that distance, we could figure out what the time was. So this is uh, obviously nothing new to you guys at the moment. Uh, but hopefully that kind of makes sense, the basics of this experiment. The crazy thing comes in is when, uh, so we could say that this is a, let's say the person doing our experiment is uh, Dr. Aaron Krokmal, hypothetical made up person that we're gonna call Aaron Krokmal. Uh, let's say that his evil twin, Darren Krokmal, is also watching this experiment but he's watching the experiment from his rocket ship. So here we have Krokmal's evil twin in his rocket ship watching the same experiment, but he's moving at a speed V relative to the earth. So the earth is down here somewhere. So same exact experiment, but from his, from evil Dr. Krokmal's point of view, he's gonna see the light move kind of in this triangular pattern, uh, just because he's moving relative to the whole experiment. Now, if light was like anything like a car or something else, he would have to find the new speed of light in his frame, and then he would end up working out and finding the same time. However, light doesn't work that way. The assumption here is that light moves at the same speed for both of these people. So what, what travel time does evil Dr. Krokmal measure for the light? Well, we're going to have to find a new delta x from, for, Dr., for evil Dr. Krokmal's point of view. And uh, it's going to be related to d, but we're going to have to do some geometry here. So, but still, it's not anything harder than other things that we've done in, uh, in lab. In my slide here, there's uh, the experimenter in the rocket ship is a she. So I, I kind of put up this Dr. Krokmal analogy on the last, uh, at the last moment here, but uh, sorry for the inconsistency with pronouns. So let's try to compute, let's see what time the experimenter on the rocket ship will measure for the travel time for light. It's really just some um, geometry of triangles, nothing more complicated than you guys have been doing this all year now. So we'll call this delta x, we'll call it d prime. And what we're really going to have to do is just use the Pythagorean theorem. This distance here is d, and this other side of the triangle is gonna be how far the rocket ship travels in the time it takes, in the time we're watching the light. So that'll be uh, speed of the rocket ship V times this time T. So here, evil Dr. Krokmal on the rocket ship measures the speed of light as being this new distance divided by the time of the measurement T. But if we compare these two, the only way that both the experimenter on Earth and the experimenter in the rocket ship can measure the same speed is if they experience different times, is if they saw this experiment happening, taking different amounts of time to complete. And that is the thing that is completely unintuitive and the thing that doesn't make any sense from a classical physics perspective. Every experimenter, time is constant for everyone. But if the speed of light is the same for both of these different observers, the only way we could get around that is by saying that if, if an experimenter or someone is moving relative to something they're watching, is that they see time pass at a different rate. It's really trippy. And we could see, we could actually use these two formulas, combine them to see just how much difference the two times are. So I'm going to go through the algebra here quickly, but our goal is, remember, t naught is the time of the experiment measured by the person on Earth. And t is the time for the experiment measured by the person on the rocket ship. 
and we could kind of eliminate variables here and then solve for t and show that the observer sees things, sees everything around them happening at a slower, slower rate. And this phenomenon is called time dilation. It's like time is stretched out for the moving observer. Uh, and it's not a mechanical effect. It's not just that clocks are moving more slowly. Uh, it's the fact that time itself, the idea of time, is now different depending on if you're moving relative to something or if you're standing still relative to something. You see time pass at different rates depending on how quickly you're moving, which is really, really weird. Uh, and as good scientists, you might now be asking, well, this is crazy. I'm a scientist, so I'm willing to accept it. So you better give me some experimental proof of this, which would be the correct thing that you should be asking me right now. And uh, I'm going to get there in a second. There is experimental proof of this. But before I move on, I just want to point out just the idea here of what we're before. Uh, for when we were talking about cars or uh, moving objects, moving at kind of everyday speeds down the street, we don't see this effect. We don't see time as being like slowed down as we watch a person drive by their car. We don't see them aging at a slower rate. And that's because this effect is exceptionally tiny. So if you look at our formula here, you'll see in the denominator that there's this quantity v squared over c squared. So what that means is that this denominator, if our object that we're watching or the experiment we're watching is moving relative to us at a really slow speed, like some everyday speed, this denominator is basically one. And these two times are basically equal. There's no way we can measure the difference between them. It's only when the speed of we're moving relative to the experiment is a significant fraction of the speed of light, c, that this denominator becomes something less than one, and these times become different. Uh, so really, you need to be moving very fast to see this effect. Uh, faster than really human beings can really move, like 10% of the speed of light, at least. Uh, so uh, it's really, really hard to see this effect. However, we can see it in uh, particles that hit the atmosphere from space. So there are these particles that are called muons. They're subatomic particles that are uh, they're matter particles, but they're not standard matter particles. They don't, you don't see them in atoms or things, uh, but they quickly decay into electrons with a half-life of around 1.56 microseconds. So they have a very quick half-life. You can make them in particle accelerator labs. Uh, they are produced from collisions of high energy particles in the atmosphere, uh, and we can measure them. Uh, so muons that come from the sun are constantly hitting our atmosphere. And we can measure that only about 0.3 of them out of a million should reach the surface uh, based on the muons we know in lab and the half-life we measured in our labs with particle accelerators. However, many, many more of them hit the surface than expected, about like 49,000 out of a million. And the only way this could be explained is if that the muons that are moving really fast relative to us about 98% of the speed of light, is if they have a longer half-life. And if you guys have studied uh, radioactivity and chemistry or something, you'll know that half-life is kind of a real constant thing. It's just determined by the statistics of the problem. So it's not that the half-life of these particles is changing, it's that we're seeing time slow down for these muons. And more of them hit the surface because the effective time they're experiencing is less than the time we experience. It's really kind of trippy and weird. Uh, so time is not a constant. The faster you're moving, uh, the slower you, you will see time for everything you're watching. The slower you will see time passing. And it's an experimentally verified fact. I'm not saying that I'm 
going to be able to make you, this is not going to seem uh, intuitive or natural because we never move at speeds fast enough to experience this in our daily life, but it is a fact. Uh, and one that's experimentally, uh, experimentally backed up. Other consequences of relativity are that just as you uh, experience time being kind of stretched out and slowed down, if you, if you were moving really fast and you tried to get a measurement of objects you were moving by, you would see them being like compressed or shorter than they are if you were looking at them when you were at rest. This phenomenon is called length contraction. And uh, so if you're, if you're moving relative to an object and you try to measure how long it is, you'll measure it as being shorter than you would if you're standing at rest relative to that object. Uh, this is like a, this is a two scale. Uh, so if you had this two scale drawing here of the effect. So if you're moving at a, if you're standing at rest relative to the sphere, you see it like so in the first option here. If you're moving at 30% of the speed of light, you don't see much change at all. But if you get up to 60% of the speed of light and 90% of the speed of light, you'll, you'll see the uh, object you're looking at compressed or you, it will seem to be compressed along the direction of motion that you're moving. The other consequence, which I'm not going to get into, is that uh, I'm not going to get into the math of this today, but it's, it, relativity leads to a maximum possible speed at which things can travel. Uh, we could derive some formulas for showing how we uh, add velocity vectors together. And uh, the maximum possible speed limit, the maximum possible speed any object could possibly travel is the speed of light. Uh, and really only massless objects like light could travel at that speed. Anything that has mass, even a tiny amount of mass, will have to travel somewhat slower. Uh, it's a universal speed limit. I know there's a typo here where it says university speed limit. Uh, the college speed limit, the speed limit on campus is actually 15 miles per hour, so something much slower than this. Don't try to drive this speed on campus. Uh, but the fastest speed you could possibly move in the universe is the speed of light. Uh, the other thing that is related to this is that just like time and uh, uh, which uh, you can kind of, uh, if you want to go into chapter 27 of the book, of our textbook, you can read about this, but I'm not going to get into it much in class is that the connection between the changes in how we measure time and speed also end up resulting in changes in how we measure energy. And one of the results is that uh, the mass an object has uh, is associated with a type of stored energy. And so what this leads, is that, leads us to is that mass can be converted to energy and vice versa. So uh, at really, uh, the universal law in, uh, in the universe, the fact that uh, conservation of mass is only an approximate role. There are uh, situations in which mass is not conserved, in particular nuclear reactions. If you've ever done any nuclear chemistry, mass is not conserved. You can lose mass and gain energy. And this is in particular how uh, atomic energy and uh, atomic bombs work. Like uh, the uh, binding energy of the nucleus of an atom. There's so much energy there that it adds a little bit of mass to the atom. And if you could break that nucleus and release that binding energy, you lose some mass but gain a lot of free energy. And it's the principle by which atomic energy works. And that the famous equation, Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, describes that. The E is the energy associated with the mass m. So the convergent factor between mass and energy is the speed of light squared. So a little bit of, since the speed of light is so big and it's squared in this formula, a little bit of mass can, uh, if you can release the energy associated with that, with that somehow, it ends up being a lot of energy. So this is only like the very basics of the 
theory of relativity and there's much more even even at the level of our course if you go into the textbook chapter 27 you could get more info about this uh the theory of relativity and the other kind of cool stuff that happens uh as for this though this is where i'm going to stop my lecture on the material uh, I am going to, so I'm going to put up a homework on this material. However, uh, it's going to be, what it's going to be is an extra credit. It's not going to be required, but if you complete it, you will get a few points uh, back on the exam average. So probably get three points back on your exam average if you do the homework on this section. Uh, but it's, it's again, not required, only if you want to do that. Uh, so that'll be posted later this afternoon. Uh, that being said, this, uh, the homework for this section will require some, you'll have to read the chapter in the book. It'll go a little bit beyond the slides here. So uh, again, not required, but if you're interested and you would like those three points or so, uh, that'll be posted this afternoon. Other things to keep, uh, before we go here, uh, keep an eye out for another email this afternoon about info about the final exam. So I'm gonna send that out this afternoon. Uh, that being said, uh, thank you all for listening to me, to not just today, but over the course of the past year. Uh, kind of sucks that we had to end the, uh, the course and the whole semester in this way, but I, I appreciate you guys' hard work throughout the semester, your interest and your attention. Uh, you're a great class to teach. And if I uh, don't talk to you in person or see you in person, I hope you have a great summer. And uh, hopefully when this all is over, uh, see you on campus at some point. If you are seniors, congratulations for surviving your college experience and great luck, best of luck to you in the future. Uh, and hopefully I'll see you at graduation on, uh, in the fall. And that is it, you've reached the end of Physics 102. Dr. Kaiser, can you hear me? I've just unmuted myself. Uh, yes. So okay. go ahead. I sorry I had so you've had so much trouble getting in touch with me. No, uh, no, you're fine. I understand. Hmm. Okay. So I don't know if you uh, if you can share your screen with me, I'll stop. Maybe uh, that might be the easiest way. Yeah, I can try that. That's yeah, and then you could share your uh, your work. One. Yeah, can you see? This is yes. my okay. So I was doing fine. The simulation worked, like everything was fine. And then I guess I got to question three when it was talking about VF. And mm -hmm. I got confused because on the simulation, every like it, if we were supposed to measure in velocity, it would stay zero the whole time, unless I'm like forgetting to change. Ah, okay. I see uh, the issue. Do you have the simulation open? I can get that open right now. Yeah, and I will show you. Can you see the simulation or no? Yes. I can. Oh, okay. So if you if you set this up so 
so there's some electrons coming off the plate. Uh, yeah, that's good. So V sub S here is not, uh, it's not a velocity. It's, oh. I think the confusion might be notation. It's V sub S is the stopping voltage, the voltage you need to put on the plates to stop the electrons from completing the trip across. So for instance, if you try this here, there's a little slider on the battery. Yeah, okay. You're going to need a negative voltage. So if you, you'll see the electrons are released, but they, the voltage right. on the plates attracts them back to the source and stops them. Oh, okay. V sub S is the smallest voltage that will do this. Okay, so. So you can just kind like of, keep. Yeah, so you can use the slider. You can also type in numbers if you click on the box below the battery. Oh, okay. And that's a bit easier. And the other way you can do this, uh, you should be able to, if you look at the current versus voltage graph, mm -hmm. the first one, the stopping voltage is going to be where the graph hits zero, where you completely stop the current. The first point, I mean, it's kind of hard to see. You kind of have to, don't worry about being too exact with this. I'm not. So like right here, is this what? Yeah, I would say that you're, you're more or less almost there. The electrons are almost reaching the plate, the, the collector plate, but none of them are actually getting there. So I would say it's around 0.8, minus 0.8 here. So we want it so it doesn't get there. Yes. And okay. The, oh, well. I mean, that's about as, that's pretty good. So you should have zero current. Right. Yeah. So it's a, in this case, V sub S is about 0.8 or minus 0.8. Okay. And then what is that negative one for the voltage? Is that what we're supposed to record? Uh, you should record the number. The number from the battery is more exact, so it would be minus oh. 0.8. Oh, the graph is probably, the graph hits zero at minus 0.8, but it's just hard to see. Gotcha. Okay. That will, okay, that will probably make more sense for the rest of it. So, yeah. so if we go back to the question now, uh, question step three, right? Yeah, I think, yeah. So you're using... The goal is, so V sub S here will be point, minus point 0.8. And then you could use that number along with the, the known frequency of the light to solve for the work function of the metal. Okay. So here you put minus point 0.8 there and then solve for E. Right. So it'll be a bit different. It won't be 3.1, but. Okay, yeah, I'll just. I think that'll make more sense. I was getting really confused. I was like, wait, if it's zero every time, then how would the uh, frequency of light affect anything yeah. or, or the wavelength? So, yeah, so okay. you, you'll see if you change the wavelength, if you, may, if you give a higher frequency, so if you, instead of uh, purple, you do like UV somewhere, the electrons will have more energy and they'll make it across. So you'll need to up the voltage. Okay. So the stopping potential will be different. But you should see if you compute the work function, which is just a property of the metal and the plate, you should get the same thing. Oh, okay. So the, again, you kind of have to find the uh, And I believe the uh, the last part of the the last question in the lab, I think, asks you to do this uh, compute the work function for like so. Step five here. There's a mystery mm -hmm. material. Yeah. And you're going to use three different wavelengths. Find the stopping potential each time, and then find the work function. And okay. it should come out to be you're just kind of taking three different data points to get uh, an average work function. And then from there, you can uh, search work functions on Google to get the table. 
Mm -hmm. It looks like you did. Yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, so. Tried. But you should see that even if you use other wavelengths, you should get something around the same. Okay, perfect. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I will let you know if I have any more questions. Okay, <laughs> yes. Know, no problem. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. See ya. See ya.